Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's biodiversity webinar. My name is Mike Shanahan, and I'll be moderating today's event. Thank you all for coming along. This webinar has been organized by the Earth Journalism Network, or EJN, which is a program of Internews, a global media development organization. EJN's mission is to improve the quality and quantity of environmental journalism around the world. Through grants, training, and other activities, EJN supports journalists to cover issues such as climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and other issues. EJN is also a community of about 13,000 journalists in 180 countries. And if you're not a member already and would like to be, please visit the Earth Journalism website, which is earthjournalism.net, to register. By registering, you'll receive information about webinars like this and other events, as well as opportunities for funding and fellowships that EJN runs throughout the year. Today's webinar is part of EJN's Biodiversity Media Initiative, which is a three-year project that you can read about on the EJN website. Now, biodiversity is a, is a massive topic with, with many facets, and today we're focusing just on one area that has received very little media coverage, but which I think can be a very rich source of stories. And if you don't believe me, I'd like to invite you to check out a recent story by a Peruvian journalist called Jack Lo Lao for uh, the website Dial Dialogo Chino. It's called Maca, the dubious aphrodisiac Chinese biopirates took from Peru. And I'll put a link to the story into the chat and on the website where we host the recording of this webinar. Um, Jack's story's got everything. It's, it's got su suitcases full of cash. It's got seeds smuggled across international borders overnight riches and broken dreams there's a lot in there it's not a dry story for for one second please do check it out and the topic of this story and and the topic of this webinar is something called biodiversity access and benefit sharing uh, don't worry about those jargon terms for now we've got two brilliant expert speakers with us who are going to explain what they mean and also hopefully give some ideas for how journalists can get more information about these topics and, and cover these issues. Joining us from Madrid is Alejandro Lago, who is the manager of the United Nations Development Program and Global, Environmental, Global Environment Facilities Access and Benefit Sharing Project. Hello, Alejandro. Uh, thank you for coming along today. Hello, Mike. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And our other speaker is Christina Swiderska, who is a principal researcher in the Natural Resources Group at the International Institute for Environment and Development, which is based in London. Hello, Christina. Hello, everyone. Thank you. And for those of you who are watching this live, if there's something that you'd like to ask our speakers, uh, you can use the Q&A feature of Zoom, which is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we prefer you to use that instead of the chat function um, for asking questions, just so we can make sure that we see the questions and can direct them to our experts. In the chat function, you can talk among yourselves, you can share information, and you'll also find some links that we'll be putting into the chat uh, to some of the publications that our speakers have produced. So let's begin. Um, Access and benefit sharing can be quite a complicated topic. So I think we'd like to start with some basics and introduce these key concepts before getting into the deeper issues. Uh, so I'd like to invite Christina, first of all, to tell us what do we mean when we talk about use of genetic resources? Um, and can you give us some examples of this, please? Yes, so first of all, what are genetic resources? They are um, genes or DNA. Uh, functional units of hereditary with actual or potential value. So essentially they are biological resources like plants, animals, microbes or microbes, which are used for their genetic material. So not for timber or food or trade, but specifically for the genetic resources that they contain. And genetic resources can be used to develop a really wide range of products. So for example, uh, genes for drought tolerance or disease resistance in crops um, occur in wild plants or um, traditional crop varieties. And these can be used to develop new commercial varieties of crops that are more resilient to drought and disease. Um, 
or, or to develop, for example, genetically modified crops for the market. Uh, another example uh, is pharmaceutical compounds. Um, many are originally derived from plants and they're used to develop um, new drugs. Uh, some of them have been really successful uh, blockbuster drugs. Uh, they used to develop herbal medicines, cosmetics, or um, crop protection products like pesticides. Um, and then there are also uh, industrial applications, industrial uses for microbes, uh, for example, in making stonewashed jeans uh, or degrading rubbish or uh, cleaning up oil spills. Um, and in many cases, it's actually the biochemical compounds um, that are derived from genes that are used commercially or the biochemical extracts which contain the genes. Uh, and increasingly, um, there's been a shift to the use of synthetic, synthetic chemicals, uh, which may be discovered by, by studying natural compounds and genetic resources. Great, thanks, Christina. So that all sounds wonderful. It sounds like uh, nature's providing so many great things for us and uh, improving health, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's not the whole story, is it? There's, there's, a, there's a, an issue about how people actually get hold of the genetic resources and, and use them. Can you tell us about uh, what bioprospecting is and what biopiracy is, please? Yeah, so bioprospecting is the commercial use of genetic resources. So it includes the collection and research and development process. Um, and it also um, includes the collection and use of traditional knowledge relating to genetic resources, which are held by indigenous peoples and local communities. And then biopiracy is usually understood as the misappropriation of genetic resources and related traditional knowledge. So in other words, it's their commercial use without getting the consent of the countries where the resources are taken from um, or the communities uh, where the genetic resources and traditional knowledge um, are taken from. So the issue is that uh, most of the world's biodiversity is located in developing countries, but the technology to, to use um, that biodiversity, those genetic resources and turn them into commercial products is located in developed industrialized countries. So that's basically the reason for the whole uh, access and benefit sharing framework uh, to provide access uh, to industrial countries to the resources of developing countries. And the, the issue of biopiracy is um, often related to patenting of the resulting commercial products. Uh, so, um, so for example, um, in some cases, patents have been granted over products, uh, genetic resources, which have barely been modified um, uh, or even just described for the first time in chemical terms. Um, and, you know, for indigenous peoples, the idea that a, a living organism can be patented and owned privately for commercial use it is very odd as it's part of, often part of their heritage, their identity, and they have religious and spiritual values relating to the biodiversity that they, they nurture and care for. So it's not only an act of theft, but it's a totally alien thing and, a, and in some cases religiously offensive. Um, for example, when concerning seeds, seeds are, are really re regarded as givers of life. They, they are sacred um, and people can't own them um, in indigenous societies that they're collective um, custodians of, of the seeds. So examples of biopiracy include a number of US patents. So there's been a, a patent on turmeric for healing wounds, um, which is common knowledge in India. Um, a patent based on traditional knowledge over the neem tree. Uh, patents on basmati rice from India and Pakistan. And a patent uh, was granted to a US researcher on the ayahuasco vine, which is used by indigenous peoples in the Amazon for healing and for rituals. Another uh, final example I'll give is the, the Hudya example. Um, um, it's a, a species 
uh, Hudia is a species that's been used for a very long time by the San indigenous peoples of South Africa to stave off hunger and thirst. And uh, the, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa extracted the active ingredient and patented it to develop a commercial appetite suppressant, which has a huge market. Um, and it did this in partnership with Phytopharm in the UK and with Pfizer. Um, uh, it took some time and eventually this has resulted in a, in a benefit sharing agreement with the San Bushman to share some of those commercial uh, benefits. And that was after a, a report in the Observer in 2001. So anyway, I'll hand over back to you, Mike. Thanks, Christina. So, I mean, to what extent or to, to what extent is genetic resources tied up intimately with traditional knowledge in, in these cases of bioprospecting? How much of it is companies uh, trying to find new products just by randomly looking at plants? And how much of it is based on going to the plants that they that people have traditionally used for a long, long time? So obviously there's maybe more likely to be a success there. Well, traditional knowledge is, is often used to identify genetic resources with commercial potential. Um, indigenous peoples have extensive knowledge of medicinal plants, of local crop varieties with particular valuable properties. And this provides the leads um, that can really narrow down the time needed for research and development and obviously reduce the costs. Um, and in some cases, the genetic resources, I've referred to traditional crop varieties, these have actually been developed through traditional knowledge. So they embody the traditional knowledge of indigenous communities that domesticate um, crops from the wild and improve them um, and do so over generations. So um, there is um, quite often uh, the use of traditional knowledge involved rather than just genetic resources. Thanks, Christina. So you, in one sense, access and benefit sharing is, is as old as humanity and people have been uh, managing this at a community level for a long time. Um, but in another sense, access and benefit sharing is now part of a, an international legal framework. Can you, can you talk us through um, what happened in Rio at the Earth Summit, how we got the, the, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and, and what that all has to do with, with access and benefit sharing? Yes, so the, the Earth Summit in 1992 um, included um, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so that was agreed um, at the Earth Summit and it has three main objectives. The first is to conserve biodiversity. The second is the sustainable use of biodiversity. And the third is um, access and benefit sharing. So, um, Basically, developing countries insisted that they would only enter into the negotiation of this convention if the issue of access to genetic resources and sharing of the benefits from their commercial use was included in the convention. So, I mean, they argued that they should not have to pay the costs of conserving the world's biodiversity. Most of it is in there, you know, in developing countries, but by conserving it, they would forego economic opportunities. So this was really critical for them to agree to, to accept the obligation to conserve biodiversity. They would only do that in return for um, uh, developed industrialized countries agreeing to uh, allowing um, developing countries to regulate access to their genetic resources and to derive a share of the benefits from the commercial use of their genetic resources. Um, and at the time, um, in the early 90s, there were a few widely publicized um, reports of blockbuster drugs being developed uh, by pharmaceutical companies. You know, there was this talk of green gold um, that would generate funds for biodiversity conservation. Uh, so this, has become um, uh, access to genetic resources and benefit sharing is really at the heart of the biodiversity convention. Um, and um, now with the convention, developing countries have the authority 
to control access um, through prior informed consent and based on mutually agreed terms. Um, and countries are also required to encourage the equitable sharing of benefits arising from the use of traditional knowledge. So that's now enshrined in the, the Convention on Biodiversity, but um, developing countries and um, indigenous communities have actually received few benefits from the use of genetic resources and traditional knowledge. And there are some important reasons for this. So I'll just highlight some of them. So first of all, many genetic resources are already available in gene banks in the North, in industrialized countries. And much traditional knowledge is available in ethnobotanical databases. So the, these resources are the first port of call for a company um, and they can be used without benefit sharing. They're not covered. Um, the CBD only applies to genetic resources collected after its entry into force in 1993. It does not apply uh, to traditional knowledge, which is already publicly available. So that's one um, thing which greatly limits the scope of the convention. Another thing is that um, advances in technology have meant that uh, valuable compounds can now be synthesized much more easily, much more cheaply than before. And so um, the, the need for direct access to genetic resources has been reduced. Um, and also there's a lot of, um, there's been a move to, to um, digitize genetic information. So again, there's less need for physical access to genetic resources. Um, thirdly, um, the Biodiversity Convention emphasizes the sovereign rights of states over biological resources which means that communities only have rights over their traditional knowledge and not over the genetic resources associated with that knowledge. So their uh, medicinal plants or traditional crops that are collected from their territories would not be covered. And then finally, there's been a lot of resistance from industry lobbies and from also from academic researchers, um, which have made it difficult um, to really uh, enforce the CBD strongly. Um, and that difficulty has also arisen because of the complexity of ABS arrangements. So this, they involve often many different actors in developing countries, many different organizations and, and in and developed countries. And so these complex arrangements are really hard to regulate. Yes, I'll stop there. Thanks, Christina. And so just we'll, we might touch on some of that about digital sequence information and um, new ways of developing drugs later on. But in essence, what you're saying is in the past, a company would need to go and actually physically get hold of some plants in order to extract something from them or screen them for their potential as a drug, whereas now they can just go to a database um, and access the genetic code of that plant or, or work out um, what compounds that plant could produce through its, through its genetic information. Um, so there's no need to even step out of the, the laboratory um, and go to another country. Um, can you bring us up to date and just tell us, well, not up to date, but to 2010 and tell us a, a little bit about what the Nagoya Protocol is and how that fits into the, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the Nagoya Protocol uh, deals um, exclusively with this uh, third objective of the Biodiversity Convention on access to genetic resources and benefit sharing. So the Biodiversity Convention just provides a, a really basic framework, um, but the Nagoya Protocol provides more detail uh, in, on that um, access and benefit sharing objective. It also um, goes further than the Biodiversity Convention with respect to traditional knowledge. So the Nagoya Protocol requires parties to introduce legal measures to ensure the prior informed consent of indigenous peoples and local communities and equitable benefit sharing with them for, for the use of genetic resources held by them. But this is to be done in accordance with domestic legislation regarding the established rights 
of indigenous peoples and local communities over their genetic resources and their rights to grant access in domestic law. So it really leaves it up to governments um, to decide how to implement that or whether to implement it. Um, but it is a step in the right direction. And secondly, the Nagoya Protocol also um, requires countries to ensure prior informed consent and equitable benefit sharing with indigenous peoples and local communities for access to their traditional knowledge based on mutually agreed terms. And so that, that requirement on traditional knowledge is also strengthened. Um, and when uh, countries implement the, the Nagoya Protocol, they are required to also take into consideration the customary laws and community protocols of indigenous peoples and local communities relating to traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. So not to genetic resource associated with, they don't have to take into account customary laws associated with genetic resources, but only <laughs> with traditional knowledge um, associated with genetic resources. So it's a, it's a little bit weaker than many indigenous communities would like. Um, and the Nagoya Protocol um, requires parties, well, it doesn't say requires, it says uh, parties shall try to support as appropriate the development of community protocols by communities um, on access to traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources and benefit sharing. Um, and those community protocols allow communities to set their own conditions um, based on customary laws, um, which is good. So that's a step in the right direction. The other thing that the Nagoya Protocol does um, is it requires simplified measures on access for non-commercial research purposes, taking into account the need to address a change in, of intent for such research. And this is quite important because, you know, having um, laws which restrict access impose costs on you know, researchers who are just conducting academic research on genetic resources. And so the problem is that that research can lead to commercial um, outputs, even if they weren't planned. So now there's a requirement to take into account the change of intent, the change of use, if that occurs during the research process. So I'll stop there. So, so that would be, so for example, uh, a biologist goes to a tropical country uh, to study some frogs, gets permission to take frog samples back to their museum. And then years later, someone looks at those frogs and finds a compound in them that could be a useful uh, medicine. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about when you're talking about change of use? Yes, exactly. Because, because there are simplified measures for access for non-commercial use, um, the researcher that first got that uh, those genetic resources may not have had to establish uh, mutually agreed terms and, and conditions for benefit sharing because it was for non-commercial use. But then if that use changes, then they will then have to establish uh, mutually agreed terms for benefit sharing. Thanks. And do you know, have there been any cases where uh, this has happened, where the the, 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 the resources have been used for one purpose and then change, and a change in use has happened or, or cases of people intentionally doing research under the cover of what looks like basic research or, or, or ecological research rather than commercialization? I don't know so much about the latter. I, I, I imagine probably, but it is quite a common occurrence that um, you know, a, a plant may be um, collected by a university and examined there, and only after examination will the commercial potential be identified. Okay, great. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Christine. I'm going to ask Alejandro to give us some of his uh, insights now. And just want to say, just before we do that, that the Convention on Biological Diversity is uh, has been adopted and, and implemented by almost all countries with the exception of the United States. Uh, whereas the Nagoya Protocol has a fewer number of parties 
but is is actually now in force itself as well. So Alejandro, can you tell us um, 10 years after the Nagoya Protocol was adopted, what, what has it achieved? Thank you very much, uh, Mike, and thank you so much also to Christina because she has made my life very easy. No, she took the hard part just to introduce all the concepts, uh, which uh, makes things much more easier now for for me. And thank you also for for the invitation because I think it's crucial that uh, journalists, environmental journalists, are aware of of this issue, this topic, because it's quite horizontal and connects no with different areas no um, and and can be a very powerful instrument um, in regard to to the consecution of uh, sustainable development goals no um, I, I would like if you allow me Mike to connect with the last idea that uh, Christina was uh, presenting regarding the the key uh, gaps that the Nagoya protocol was trying to address to highlight one that I think it was just embedded in, in um, the points that uh, he covered, she covered. But I think one is quite important that is the compliance measures no? um, that are introduced in the Nagoya Protocol. With the Convention on Biological Diversity, countries um, for the first time uh, obtain the recognition that they have sovereign rights over their genetic resources, okay? So before that, it, it used to be considered as free access, okay? So you could go and you could do bioprospection, you could search for new compounds uh, um, and go to your lab and you should not uh, explain anything to anyone. That would be yours. You will develop the product, that's it, okay? With the Convention on Biological Diversity, countries can regulate access to their genetic resources at the national level, okay? But the problem is that they were alone. They were on their own, okay? They only had national legislation to regulate uh, you, Mike, going to Brazil in the Amazon. Um, so the Brazilian legislation applies in Brazil. As soon as you were leaving back to the UK with your back uh, full of different um, samples no, that you took here and there, and that are very difficult to to detect, no, in in the in the customs or uh, in your during your travel, right? So you went back to the to your lab, you developed your product, and the Brazilian legislation is was it was just uh, wet paper, no, in the UK. The Nagoya Protocol is trying to address that, introducing compliance measures. So now, users of genetic resources countries that, ha that use genetic resources have to put in place measures to control their users, okay? And um, that's why it was very important what Christina was saying, that the Nagoya Protocol differentiates between uh, facilitated access for non-commercial research and a more complicated system for commercial research, okay? Now that is possible because someone is going to control that back in the user country, okay? So Mike, you were saying, well, I moved to the lab, I got a permit for non-commercial research, but now, oh, I discovered something interesting. Okay, before Nagoya, you could go ahead and no one will be able to stop you and your product could be legal. And that was a risk for the provider country. Now, you as user have a problem because in your country, Someone is going to tell you, ah, oh, interesting. Where did you get this genetic resource? Well, I got it from Brazil. Show, show me your permit. Here's my permit. Oh, but this is for non-commercial research and you are applying for a patent or you are requesting uh, uh, to commercialize a product. You don't have a permit for that. So you have to go back to Brazil and now you need to ask for a commercial permit, okay? So the compliance measures are also a key part of the system of the Nagoya Protocol. Now, uh, user countries have to control the users, okay? So the problem is now shared between the providers and the users. It's not uh, an issue isolated for the providers as it used to be in the past, okay? Before the Nagoya Protocol. 
apologies for starting with such a long uh, extra point, uh, but I think it was uh, uh, needed, no, and, and connected very well with the last point made by by Christina. So going back to your question, where are we ten years after the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol? No. So I wanted to share you this uh, website, which is um, the formal. Uh, the official page of the uh, access and benefit sharing uh, cleaning house. This is the main platform to exchange information about access and benefit sharing, okay? One of the key gaps that the Nagoya protocol is also trying to address is lack of information. Access and benefit sharing is very much related with information because countries didn't know what um, their genetic resources have been used by third countries, by uh, commercial companies, or even by researchers, okay? That information is not easily available. So here is an important reference point for everyone and also for journalists, okay? So this is the official uh, website. Here you can see that uh, 10 years after the adoption of the Nagoya Protocol, the Nagoya Protocol entered into force in 2014, um, and now we have 129 uh, parties that you can see in the in the screen. And it's quite nice. It's a quite quite nice uh, number, uh, and it's also I would highlight quite balanced because the risk is that we could have only provider countries, no, that are searching for this extra protection that the Nagoya Protocol is providing. Um, and users continue to do the same thing, no? Business as usual, without caring about uh, provided countries. Fortunately, we can see that very important uh, users um, are uh, parties to the, to the Nagoya Protocol, such as the European Union, uh, United Kingdom, Norway, uh, Switzerland, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, no? Of course, we can see also big gaps, no? Uh, we can see in the map, you mentioned already, uh, Mike, the US is not a party to the convention and until they don't ratify the convention, they cannot become a party to this instrument, okay? So it's completely unexpected that they will join, okay? The, the Nagoya Protocol at a certain point, which is a challenge because of course, biotech companies, uh, big biotech companies uh, operate and, and are based in the US, no? Uh, but we also have another important parties to the convention that are not uh, party to the to the protocol for the time being, such as Canada, Russia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, no, uh, or even some uh, providing countries, no, like uh, Brazil. We can see Colombia um, uh, as well, no. So the protocol is is evolving. Uh, we have uh, decent numbers. But it's true that um, it's still uh, in the making, no? uh, and countries are uh, trying to put in place and to comply with all the different uh, rules. No? Um, I believe we have made some progress. So uh, now users, uh, and, and when I refer to users, I mainly refer to researchers and um, biotech companies, so, so private companies. Um, I think they are more aware, definitely, of their obligations, uh, so they cannot uh, go to a third country and take whatever they want and go back to their labs, but they are now controlled and they know they have to comply with those regulations. And I think also uh, providers, uh, as it was explained by Christina before, in particular indigenous peoples and local communities, are more aware about their rights are more aware of, of how to add value to those kind of value chains, and they are articulating those collaborations no? uh, through the development of instruments that can articulate their rights. No? And, and Christine already mentioned that maybe the key instruments there can be the biocultural community protocols. No? So mixed feelings, um, uh, we have in practice, uh, six years uh, since the protocol entered enter into force, which is a short period of time. Um, but we are moving, I think, in the in the right direction. 
Thanks, Alejandro. I'm going to put one of the questions to you that has come in in the chat from a, a journalist called Joydeep Gupta in India, who, who says, how many of the countries, um, I, I'm guessing he means countries that are party to the Nogoya Protocol, have the statutory authorities that can enforce ABS rules? Well, um, going back, if you allow me, and I disconnected my screen too early, I think, uh, based on this question, uh, the good thing of, um, of this page is that you have all the official information. No? So you can see that although there are 129 parties, there are uh, 176 countries that have communicated uh, national focal point, okay? And 124 countries have competent national authorities, uh, which I think is it was the main uh, point of the question uh, from from this person. No, so 124 countries um, have established their competent national authority, the the authorities at the national level that are going to uh, provide or grant the the access permits. Okay. Um, and you can see the number of permits um, uh, below over here. Uh, you can see there are 2,110 international recognized certificates of compliance, uh, which are the national permits that have been notified to the access uh, um, beneficiary uh, clearing house. Okay. I recommend you to, to go to, the, to this website uh, because there are a lot of information and again, the idea is to uh, be able to exchange. No, uh, there are also uh, other non-official information from stakeholders, and you can see, for instance, here you can access community protocols and uh, procedures um, and customary law, no, from different countries, uh, and and you can see that uh, Mexico, for instance, has been extremely active under a recent uh, UND uh, project from the United Nations Development Program no? over there. I hope I, I have addressed the, the, the question. Thank you. And we have a few other related questions coming into the chat, but I, I'll come back to them uh, after just following up with a couple of other things with you first, Alejandro. Um, Perfect. C Christina mentioned earlier on that one of the, uh, one of the hopes about this whole access and benefit sharing um, concepts in a legal international legal treaty uh, was that it would generate finance for conservation and and that it would be the the financial reward to the developing countries for their act of providing these resources. To what extent has ABS generated um, finance to, to support conservation activities? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. And, and I think uh, Christina already mentioned that um, probably when the convention um, was, uh, was signed and it didn't enter into force, um, uh, the, the topic of access and benefit sharing generated a lot of expectations, no? uh, like the green goal, as you mentioned before. No? Um, and unfortunately, uh, I don't think those expectations were met no, by, by access and benefit sharing. Um, and I can see Christina clearly saying, no, 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 um, which is to a certain extent uh, normal. No? I think we have nice cases of access and benefit sharing. Um, indeed, uh, through the chat, we are going to share some of those cases. And we, we are doing an effort in our project, for instance, to compile, to gather all those pro to, 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 to gather all those uh, cases, um, to be able to showcase them, no? to, to give publicity, how ABS access and beneficiary works or should be working. No? But my impression is that they are still rather exceptional. No? And we are still far from getting access and beneficiary agreements as the rule, okay? And what we are trying to do and our objective is that um, legal access and benefit sharing is the normal procedure when uh, someone is utilizing a genetic resource or uh, a traditional knowledge associated with a genetic resource. No? Um, that is a big challenge because we need to put together 
different stakeholders. Again, this is not just about environmental protection, it's something else. Um, normally is handled or managed by ministries of environment, uh, but they have not been managing uh, genetic resources. They have been managing a species or spaces, no, like protected areas. Um, so this is more about research. This is more about social justice. Uh, this is about human rights, as uh, mentioned by Christina before, for indigenous po peoples and local communities, no? So to put together all of that uh, and to coordinate and, and create that uh, virtuous uh, circle is, is complex, no? Complex, no? It's not that easy. And, and I think that was mentioned also by, by Christina, no? Before the complexity is one of the, the key uh, challenges, no? But to go back to your initial question, because I think I jump also into the challenges uh, too early. I think we, there are some countries, for instance, that have more experience like Brazil or um, India, that the number of permits uh, is growing steadily and they have already generated through the access and beneficiary funds at the national level, certain amount no, of funds but it's still far from what they were expecting no? and we are all expecting. Uh, but yes, I think those countries that have been more, uh, have established more standardized uh, procedures and they have some years of experience already, um, they are starting to, to have uh, uh, nice uh, funds no? Over, oh, under this uh, these kind of instruments at the national level. I wouldn't have the exact figure. I think in the case of Brazil can be around two, three, four, five millions at the moment, which is, if you see, of course, the potential of Brazil is still very limited. No? Um, and the same goes for India. No, They have, um, let me check, uh, around uh, 2,000, yes, 1,300 permits, and they probably have around 5 million no? uh, under the beneficiary fund, which is still very limited, no? but at least is, uh, is uh, making progress in the right direction, I would say. You mentioned Brazil then, uh, Alejandro, in that response, and we've had a question come in through the chat about whether you have any insights as to why Brazil hasn't joined the Nagoya Protocol, given that it's <laughs> you know, such a big, big uh, holder of biodiversity and, and a historical victim of some biopiracy as well. Yeah, no, it's amazing how these things work. I was lucky enough to be involved in the negotiations of the Nagoya Protocol um, and for uh, mega diverse countries. So the big uh, countries uh, with the most uh, richer biodiversity um, to adopt the Nagoya Protocol was a question of life or death for the Convention on Biological Diversity, okay? Uh, the future of the Convention for them was at the stake if there was not going to be a Nagoya Protocol. No? And they were fighting very strongly, no? And negotiating very hard to get the Nagoya Protocol uh, adopted, which was fantastic. But when they move into the national level, that's a different issue, right? And they uh, found a lot of resistance no? from, and again, Christine, I think uh, already mentioned no? uh, the, the resistance from different lobbies. No? Um, in the case of Brazil, I think it was agro industry. No? Uh, there was a big uh, clash with uh, agro industry um, and they're still trying to, to ratify the protocol. Apparently, I think it was ratified in the parliament, if I'm not wrong, uh, some months ago, but um, I, I believe there are still some procedures to, to go, no? But nevertheless, uh, they have a, a strong system at the national level, very standardized. They, they place 1% no, or, of the benefits as, as beneficiary going back to the country. Um, so yes, uh, one thing is to negotiate at the international level and a very different thing is to approve this, no, uh, and ratify this at the national level, no. And we have peculiar countries, uh, peculiar cases like uh, Colombia or Brazil, no, in Latin America, 
that have not been able yet to ratify the, the protocol. But we, we hope definitely that for them is an instrument to protect no, their genetic resources and traditional knowledge, and they should be party to the, to the protocol. Thank you, Alejandro. We've, we've had a few more questions come in. I'd like to uh, maybe put some of these into the discussion now because um, we're pushing on through time. Uh, and uh, Christina, feel free to, to answer as well these questions because they are uh, re relevant to some of the areas you've worked in as well. Uh, Joy Deep Gupta asks, since the Nagoya Protocol entered into force in 2014, how many cases have been filed around the world for alleged violation of access and benefit sharing rules? And how many of them have led to convictions? I'm not aware of any, to be honest. Uh, so um, the Nagoya Protocol does not establish an international court on uh, access and benefit sharing, no? where we can just uh, judge these kind of cases, it establishes some uh, compliance measures in user countries, and we have not seen uh, those cases. What we are seeing, for instance, like the case that you started with uh, from Peru now, is that some countries, and I think Peru in this case, anticipated no, the role of the Nagoya and the structure of the Nagoya Protocol. When they established in uh, the, the year 2002, I believe, uh, a commission against biopiracy, no? and it's called like that, a commission against biopiracy. And the interesting thing is that this commission sits in the office of intellectual property, okay? Uh, so they are checking around the world key species that are endemic from Peru to check what kind of patents are being requested in, uh, in other countries. No? in order to detect these cases of non-compliance of biopiracy, okay? The problem they, they face many times is that intellectual property system allows you to go against um, these kind of patterns when they are based on or when they use existing knowledge, okay? So when there is no innovative, no innovation on it, but and, and, and most of the cases that Peru is raising in different countries against, against these patents are based exactly on that, on the lack of innovation, okay? The problem is that they cannot do anything for the lack of compliance with the permit, with the legal access to the genetic resources, okay? And that is something that we are also trying to, to get included into the patent system, no? It's not just a question of innovation, it's a question of whether the, the genetic resource, the raw material was legally accessed no? in the providing country. And that only is recognized in some countries. No? Not all the countries have established a checkpoint in patent offices. No? So that is growing. We have more cases, we have more information. Countries uh, start to develop some uh, tools to check what is happening around the world with their genetic resources. Um, India, for instance, has recently developed um, a tool to search not only uh, on uh, patent databases, but also in other kind of research databases to identify this kind of utilization of the, their genetic resources. No? So I think more, more cases uh, would be coming as soon as we start to have more information. No? Um, available. Christina, have you you've got your hand up there? Can you? Uh, uh, that's it. Yeah, just to add, um, there have been a few cases where patents have been revoked um, because um, there's been no novelty involved, so they've been contested. Uh, one of them is the patent over the neem tree. So, and this was happening even before the Nagoya Protocol. So I think that that is an important thing to highlight and to monitor as it is a good way to stop these spurious patents. Yes, and, and it's true. I was referring to cases under the Nagoya Protocol or utilizing no, the new rules of the Nagoya Protocol. I'm not aware of any case, no? but definitely the, the um, intellectual property rights and, and the patent procedures have been used 
to fight no, against uh, patterns that were based on uh, previous knowledge, no, like uh, traditional knowledge, and in a very effective way. Of course, the problem or the limitation is that many times you can um, you can um, avoid that the pattern is granted, uh, but the product could uh, still be in the in the market. Okay, so uh, the important thing is that the measures of the Nagoya Protocol continue to protect these kind of things, no, uh, at the different levels. Because again, okay, I don't get the pattern, but no one is going to impede me to go to the market to continue to be in the market with that product, no. And the important thing is that we have rules also for commercialization that impede that kind of use no? uh, when there is illegal access. No? But again, to standardize these kind of procedures is, is a challenge. No? Not all the user countries have put in place compliance measures or are not uh, checking, no? uh, using the checkpoints in the same uh, effective no? points. So that, that is also challenging. No? I think we need some kind of a standardization no? of access procedures, but also compliance measures no? in order to have a more, uh, probably more clear uh, rules of the game. No? Thank you. We've got, we've got another question here from India, and this is about the implementation of ABS rules in within a country. So Krishna, the journalist from India has said, do you have any data on ABS implementation in India? The Biodiversity Act was enacted in 2002, but not many companies are willing to pay for, uh, to apply for genetic resources. And the National Biodiversity Authority is, is trying to do something about this, but what action can be taken against these violators? Well, the, the first thing would be to apply uh, Indian law, no? So if the violators are um, Indian companies, uh, that could be uh, addressed at the national level, no? India, as we mentioned already, uh, has been very active and is very experienced, no? Uh, as, as the person is uh, indicating, they have a system on access and beneficiary since uh, 2002. And they have a specific authority, the National Biodiversity Authority, that uh, keeps track uh, and monitors implementation. No? I, I, I am aware that they were uh, reviewing and updating the guidelines. They have a guidelines to apply, you know, and I uh, very aware that they are trying to um, convey the message clearly to users that this is not a new uh, kind of uh, taxation uh, or additional tax, but this is serving a purpose no? and is generating funds to conserve biodiversity, but it's also uh, to support um, local communities no? um, in that effort to, to conserve and sustainable use uh, biodiversity. So it's a process, violations at the national level could be handled uh, through the nationalization without involving the Nagoya Protocol necessarily. Thanks. We're, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. We have about five minutes left. And uh, one of the questions that's uh, come in is, is about what's happening later this year. This is uh, one of the so-called big years for biodiversity. The uh, Convention on Biological Diversity Will, is meant to be meeting in China later this year. Uh, for uh, parties to agree a, a new global framework for essentially saving nature and uh, ensuring that humanity continues to benefit from it in a sustainable way. Uh, is a access and benefit sharing going to be part of the negotiations? Does the do negotiations continue under the Nagoya Protocol and if so, what kind of issues should journalists be looking out for as uh, they prepare to cover this big, big biodiversity meeting and its outcomes? ABS is a key uh, component, is a key objective of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and therefore is a key part no, of these uh, post-2020 negotiations. No? Um, and I think one of the challenges is to um, mainstream access and beneficiary 
into the other objectives of the convention okay so not to keep it as an isolating uh, isolated uh, issue that uh, goes in a in a parallel uh, channel but that all are connected and work in the same direction so one of the challenges for the post 2020 negotiations is that better integration of access and benefit sharing into the uh, strategic framework that is coming now i think another one and it, that was mentioned by christina uh, in her intervention is emerging challenges no, of the last years like digital sequence information no? uh, what happened with all the information that is available in those databases no? um, some countries argue that that information is not covered under the nagoya protocol or the countries argue that uh, it is for sure because when a researcher uh obtaining that sequence was going to nature taking the genetic resource moving to the lab it was not coming from the air it was coming from a sample right um so definitely it is under the scope of of the nagoya protocol and we need to to define uh, countries need to define um how to deal with that no how to deal what what are the most convenient uh solutions to address digital sequence information uh to have legal access and to have also benefit sharing you know? because in my view one of the problems is that of course researchers and, and biotechnology is a great development uh, for all of us no doubt uh, that um, new pharmaceutical products uh, new cosmetics uh, new phytosanitary products make you no know, uh, humanity to to move forward um, but the problem is that that is not benefiting all of us in the same way you no know? and and i think digital sequence information is is a very good example you no know? uh, although most of the databases uh, have free access not all the countries have the capacity even they are, if if the access is free to do something with that information, to develop products from that information. No? So to um, to tackle that point is going to be extremely important. And I think to, to close on this, uh, my last reflection is that we need to measure no? uh, the impact of access and benefit sharing. No? Are we generating the incentives that we were expecting on this part, no? on commercial and on non-commercial research? How is that? making uh, uh, rich biodiversity countries uh, progress no what is the impact on uh, social development okay what is the impact on the sustainable development goals of this specific instrument no so we need to measure that because we we don't have that information and it's important to be able to to understand if we are uh, moving in the right direction and and really having an instrument that makes a difference no? uh, on the ground Christina, do you want to add anything about the uh, COP15 biodiversity uh, meeting in China? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to also pick up on what Alejandro was just saying. I mean, indigenous peoples and local communities have received very little in terms of benefits and incentives from access and benefit sharing. So, um, you know, 80% of the world's biodiversity is, is located on indigenous peoples lands and territories, and yet um, access and benefit sharing has provided no incentive for them to conserve this biodiversity. So in fact, many indigenous peoples have become very disillusioned um, with this framework. And um, you know, what they want is access to the genetic resources themselves. A lot of their genetic resources have been collected and they're held in gene banks, a traditional potato varieties, for example, and they need them for climate adaptation. So they, they really want a, a different kind of access and benefit sharing that provides them with access to genetic resources that have been collected from their territories and that they've since lost and enables them to develop and provides direct benefits because they could be waiting their whole lives to receive benefits and get nothing. So I think that's an issue to highlight. Um, and for COP15, um, you know, I think really indigenous peoples have to have um, a stronger role in decision making in the convention. They're still very marginal and traditional knowledge is 
only mentioned in in two of the targets out of 20 of the biodiversity targets um, and you know the whole framework of the biodiversity convention is very much based on governments making decisions and doing the implementation when the biodiversity is is not controlled by governments it's on indigenous people's lands so it, this really needs to change it has to become much more bottom up thank you if you allow me mike just to to follow up directly on on the last point raised by by christina I think that's crucial no? uh, to mobilize all the society for this incoming uh, conference of the parties, because it's a crucial one. No? And I think journalists can play definitely a tremendous role on that, no? uh, providing information on the key issues no? and highlighting whether countries and our leaders um, are committed and really uh, looking for the adoption of ambitious targets, uh, concrete targets that can uh, so to, to make the difference, no? uh, because it, it's a crucial moment to act. No? So I think that's, that's critical no? that we are able to mobilize uh, all the right holders, all the stakeholders, all the society at large. And I think journalists are crucial no? in that mobilization. Thank you, Alejandro, and, and thank you, Christina, for, for joining us today. We're out of time now, so I would like to just thank you both for sharing your knowledge and, and your time. Uh, we'll be putting a video of this webinar up on the EJN website, so you can uh, watch it again if you want to see it more than once, or you can share it with colleagues who, who haven't seen it. And um, we'll be doing several more webinars in the biodiversity series over the course of the year. So um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to answer all of the questions that were put into the chat, but we can uh, connect any journalists up with our speakers if that's what they would like. And also we'll be including links to several of the reports and websites that we've discussed today when we put this video on, on the website. So thank you both. It's been a really interesting conversation. I've, uh, I've learned quite a lot today and I hope that many of the journalists watching I've also learned plenty and have had some inspiration for, for some stories they might produce in the future. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Mike. And don't hesitate to contact us. I mean, the Global ABS project will continue until June and we are here to support you. So congratulations for your work. And, and again, we are just at your disposal. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Mike. And do contact me and any journalists who want to discuss further. Thank you so much. Thank you.